pushing the limits of the master system. Like the NES, but longer, and also shorter. Like the NES, but with a hedgehog instead of a plumber, and also very popular in Brazil. Yes, it's hard to talk about the Master System without comparing it to the NES, but the Master System was a different machine altogether, one with a unique library, and I'm going to take a look at a few of the games that pushed it to the limits. Not necessarily the best games to play, but the ones that were the most technically impressive. So let's start with R-Type, happily both a very good game and a limit pusher as well. R-Type comes heavy loaded with things to recommend it, a superb conversion of IREM's multicoloured pixel explosion, done by a company who were themselves already shooting game experts, Compile. You really could not have picked a better team to do the conversion, the same group who'd already given us shooting classics like Zanak and Aleste, yes, they knew what they were doing. The game looks superb, as close as you could really expect to the arcade original, and it plays beautifully too. A touch more deliberate than the coin-operated wallet warrior, it's not quite as fast, but it's also mercifully a bit easier for it, slightly better balanced for the home market. R-Type was one of those games that was ported to nearly everything at the time, and it turned out remarkably well wherever it went. It must have had some sort of good luck aura about it, but the Master System is easily the best 8-bit version by far, unless we're going to count the PC Engine under that banner, and even then it's a pretty close run. Notably, this version loses very little from the original. All eight levels are there. It even adds a secret exclusive level, if you can find it. It's remarkably complete, something made much easier by the larger ROM sizes the Master System allowed. From the word go, cartridges could potentially be up to 4 megabytes in size, and this game was 512 kilobytes. A lot for an 8-bit game in 1988. The sheer amount of enemies and backgrounds sliding past made possible by the amount of space it had available. I suppose you could argue that this doesn't really throw up any surprises technically, but it does make brilliant use of the resources it has available. Graphics on this system are made up of backgrounds and sprites. Backgrounds should be fairly self-explanatory, and sprites anything that moves independently of the background, the player ship, enemies, etc. The trouble is, you can only have so many sprites on screen at once before flickery graphical glitches start to appear. Something that does happen here, well, quite often, but not as much as you think it would do given the system's limitations. R-Type seems to be constantly skirting the edge of what's possible visually on this system without it having a big hit on the gameplay, and the end result is a definite system high point despite coming out relatively early in its lifespan. Can it be topped? Well, technically, maybe, by another Japanese shooter from 1992, it's Seigaya. The conversion of Darius II, the arcade game not the 5th century BC ruler of the Achaemenid Empire, just so you know, based on the Mega Drive version of the same game. Why did they change the name? Well, they must have been fed up with people getting it mixed up with ancient Near Eastern rulers, I suppose. Stripped down a bit from the 16-bit release, there's quite a few less stages in the choose-your-own-path game layout, but what there is is surprisingly close to its bigger brother. The graphics, like our type are colourful and dense. There's a lot of action on the screen and not much flicker. But there is one thing that this certainly has over our type and in fact, well, pretty much any other game on this system, and that is the wealth of weird scrolling effects on display. I would call it parallax scrolling, but people will come playing, so let's call it split-screen scrolling. Different parts of the background moving at different rates to give the illusion of depth. The NES may not have been quite as powerful as the Master System, but it did have the advantage of having hardware upgrades built into its cartridges, support chips to supplement its capabilities, something Sega's baby lacked. Right? Well, yes, that's true, but much of the time these expansions weren't needed on the Master System. It already had the relevant gubbins built in, and the graphical effects in Sega provide the perfect example. These effects rely on a scanline counter, something the SMS had right from the start. And what on earth is a scanline counter, you may well ask? Well, let me explain. 
scan lines are the horizontal lines of pixels across the screen that make up the game's graphics, drawn one by one as the image is sent to the TV. With a scan line counter, you can tell automatically which line is being drawn at any given moment, allowing you to basically change the image as it's being drawn, opening the door to a lot of neat graphical effects that would otherwise be much harder to do. With a scan line counter, you can fairly easily split the screen up into different sections and use the old SMS's built-in scrolling capabilities to move them along at different rates, giving that split effect as shown here in this section. A particularly nice application of this trick can be seen in the first level, that swirly flaming gas cloud thing going on, a recreation of the arcade originals opening. It looks a bit different than it does on some levels, but the technique is the same, just applied in a slightly different way. Using a debug feature of the Emulicious emulator, we can view just the background as it's stored in the system's video memory and see what's actually happening. Yes, it's really just a static image, the swirly effect given by moving different parts of the screen back and forth at different times. Those white lines represent the edge of what's being shown. At the top, where the status bar is, it all stays still. The very bottom moves along at a constant rate, and in the middle, it inches back and forth in a wavy pattern, giving the swirl we see on the screen. The NES could do this sort of thing, quite a few games did, but not without those add-ons in the cart, something that was totally unnecessary in Sega Land. Now let's move on to another game, one that looks entirely different, but actually uses some of the same techniques. It's Road Rash. Released in 1994, a conversion of the Mega Drive hit that birthed a lot of sequels through the rest of the decade. Quite a name on the scene back then. This version was developed by Probe and published by US Gold. A cursed union, surely. Two companies whose business models seem to revolve around monetizing disappointment. But well, once in a while they dropped the ball and an occasional good game slipped out. This being one of them. A pseudo 3D, 2D, over the shoulder arcade racer. If there's a genre that's died on its arse, it's surely this style of thing. Even indie developers don't seem to want to bring these games back, but it was all over the place at the time. Road Rash spices things up with some combat elements too, and it really is amazing just how well it translates over to the Master System. Maintaining darn near all the content of the 16-bit original, slightly stripped back graphically, but not nearly as much as you might think. It is a touch slower, there is less scenery and few other races to punch the tar out of, but the essence of the game is still surprisingly intact. The greatest feature though surely has to be that wonderfully undulating Kirby track, a fine example of how good these super old school racers could look when done well. Yes, the frame rate is a bit choppy, but it looks pretty great for an 8-bit racer. The distant scenery and moving clouds along with the objects on the roadside adding to the illusion. How is it done? Well, it's actually very similar to that fiery cloud effect on the first level of Segaia, would you believe? If we take a look at the background as it is in the video memory once again, we can see the effect at work. What we have is a straight road, the curve added by using the scanline counter to precisely time when narrow strips of the road are scrolled back and forth. The white lines once again showing the edges of each strip and how they are shifted relative to each other. A simple idea that probably wasn't easy to implement. The undulations of the road are created by effectively moving the horizon up and down between frames of animation. The dips nearer to the player's viewpoint created the same way, but further down the screen. A lot of games use this sort of effect, of course, you'll even see it on the specy, but rarely is it done so well. Even Sega's own major games like Outrun and Hang On never looked quite this good. Ok then, time to strike out in another direction entirely, let's make an about face into a game that's its own genre in and of itself. It's Lemmings. A 
a franchise that was a big deal for a while, but well, oddly out of the picture in recent times. Created originally by DMA Design, now known as Rockstar North, yep, those guys, I think they have bigger fish to fry these days. Now I've got to admit that this isn't the best version of this game. The Amiga original or any of the higher end ports would be better, but well it's not bad at all really. Apart from the clunky control pad interface, it's a very respectable rendition of this game. Probe software at the helm once again, but well I'm being too harsh on Probe, they had their moments and this was one of them. But nice as it is, what's so impressive about Lemmings? Even the ZX Spectrum managed a fairly decent version, surely it's a gentle stroll for the Master System. Well, no actually, and for one good reason, tile-based graphics. Yes, like a lot of its contemporaries, the SMS used tiles to draw the screen. These are ready-made, predefined blocks, 8 pixels high and 8 pixels wide. All of the graphics, both the sprites and the backgrounds, are made up of these blocks, and the Master System can store around 488 of them in its video memory at any one time. And this is where it gets difficult, because those lemmings can dig, they can build, they can even explode pretty much anywhere on the screen at any old time, giving potentially unique patterns in each game. And the fact is, it's going to be impossible to have enough of these ready-made tiles to cover every possible combination. So what do you do? Well, the solution in the NES version was just to have the lemmings dig very raggedy square holes in preset patterns, but here on the SMS, something a bit more refined happens. Instead, it generates new tiles on the fly as they are needed, calculating how they should look, depending on what's happening, and then pasting them into the video memory so they can be used on the screen. Unfortunately, the assistant doesn't have enough video memory for each bit of the screen to have its own unique tile. Some of them are always going to have to be reused, but that's not much of a problem here when a lot of the screen is going to be empty space anyway, and the game seems to be engineered to avoid gameplay situations where you might run out of tiles. Also worthy of note is the lack of flicker going on, even when there are lots of lemmings on the screen. Again, more chicanery with background tiles is happening here to fill in the gaps and make up for times when there aren't enough sprites to go around. It isn't perfect, but it works well enough to paper over the flickering issues that would otherwise be inevitable. It's interesting to note that the NES could do stuff like this, but it required extra RAM to be present in the cartridge. In fact, the amazing NES version of Elite uses a very similar technique in a different way to draw its wireframe 3D. But, well, let's not get too bogged down in the competition and move on once again. Presenting a very late release from Brazil, it's Street Fighter 2. Yes, in 1997 when this game came out, even the next gen but one Saturn was on a serious decline in the rest of the world, but in Brazil's unique gaming scene, Sega's 8-bit underdog still had a few laps left in it, hence this courageous port of one of the decade's biggest hits. Is this a good game? Not really. Is it impressive? Well, yes it is. The towering hits of the early 90s, those densely colourful, visually intense fighting games, were the final killing blow for 8-bit systems, really. They just didn't have the power. The master system of all the old guard, though, is the one that held out the longest and gave the fighting game the best try, as evidenced here. There are a lot of things wrong with this, the music is really, really terrible, the animation is choppy, most of the moves are missing, the backgrounds are, well, somewhat sparse, I could go on. Believe me when I say that it plays about as good as it looks, which is to say, well, not great, but, well, not bad for a system like this. The two-button pad of the Master System and the mysterious absence of some major characters meant that this was never going to be the full experience, but, well, it could have been worse. One criticism we can't level at this is Flicker. Those are very large characters bouncing around the screen. Even if you put all the sprites of the SMS together, it surely couldn't handle all that without becoming a flickery mess, could it? So how was it done? Well, with some very neat trickery, not a million miles away from Lemmings. Yes, it uses background graphics to supplement the sprites. Let's take a look at just the background layer here, and we'll see that one character is constructed entirely out of background tiles, leaving the other to be constructed with available sprites. 
This is really the only way you're going to get such large characters on the screen without any flicker. But doing this wasn't easy because again, like Lemmings, it's not practical to have every possible needed background tile in the memory. You can't have every part of every character laid over every part of every background in every configuration that could happen. You're going to have to create new tiles as they are needed. When you use sprites, the graphics chip does the work of seamlessly laying each sprite over the background layer while still leaving it visible around the edges. But when you're doing it with just background tiles, well, you're going to have to write code to do it manually. This wasn't all that unusual in the 8-bit world. Many systems didn't have any built-in sprite handling capabilities at all, so had to do this all the time. The ZX Spectrum, for example. But on the Master System, it was pretty rare, except in extreme cases like this. This process probably explains why this incarnation of Street Fighter is so choppy. It runs at just 10 frames per second. Doing all this messing around with background tiles takes a lot of computing power. And even when you've drawn the tiles, you've still got to load them into the video memory in the right place. All of this takes time, which means you can only update what's happening on the screen at such a limited rate. But there was one game that did something quite similar, but a bit better. So let's wind back a few years and take a quick look at Mortal Kombat. Yes, it's Probe once again, but maybe a bit of a return to form for them, because this, well, this is not all that great. Like Street Fighter 2, it's impressive for the system, but not, not the most faithful version of Midway's misspent youth-filling gore-fest. If anything, it looks a little worse than Street Fighter, the digitised characters not making the jump to 8 bits unmolested. But it does have one advantage, and that's the frame rate. Yes, it's not brilliant, but it is quite a bit less choppy than what we've just seen. The rate goes up and down, but the frames per second never seems to drop below about 15. Not amazing, but a decent bump. How is it done? Well, Probe's Mortal Kombat uses the same technique as Street Fighter 2, but in a more intelligent way. If we take a look at just the background graphics once again, we can see that one character is made from background tiles and the other sprites like before, but it's not always the same one being drawn in the same way. It switches back and forth between the two. Why? Well, I think this is to minimise the amount of background tiles that need to be drawn and put into the video memory in every frame. My assembly hacking skills aren't really good enough to confirm this, but it seems to have some sort of algorithm that determines how to draw the graphics in a more efficient way, requiring less processor time and less memory bandwidth, upping the frame rate. Also, I suspect the simplicity of the backgrounds plays a part here too. Lower colour depth probably reduces the load as well. It's a shame the end result isn't all that wonderful, really. Programmer Keith Burkill seems to have spent a long time on getting this right. Yes, pushing the limits doesn't necessarily mean it's a good game, even when the tech stuff is on point. Ok, ok, one last fighting game before we call it a do. Yes, time is knocking on, but if I'm talking about limit pushing fighting games, I've got to talk about this. From 1994, it's Jang Pung 3. Jang Pung 2 was pretty poor, Jang Pung 1 doesn't seem to exist, but what appears to be the second, third and final entry in the series is a little weird, but worth a gander. The plot seems to involve some sort of Nazi robot dinosaur uprising, written in the more innocent 90s when this sounded like a truly terrible thing, rather than the light relief it would be in these difficult times. Yes, it's got a sort of budget supermarket off-brand air about it, a selection of not all that surprising fighter characters with a few oddballs thrown in, all from, well, less well-known world cities, so much so the character select screen looks a bit like Ryan his website. Half beat, but it plays well, looks darn good actually, and has a whole load of colourful and even animated backgrounds. And okay, the music isn't great, but well, it's better than Street Fighter. Interesting though, this takes a very different tack to the previous games in how it draws its graphics, going entirely with sprites for its characters. Large characters means that the sprite limit is hit very quickly, so things do get, well, very, very flickery. But actually, most of the time, it looks okay. The result of this is a much, much better frame rate though. In fact, it seems to run at the max 60 frames per second most of the time. 
Yes, the animations aren't updated so quickly, but this was a very common feature of fighting games in this era, and as you can see here, stuff is happening on every frame. It works so well that you might wonder why anybody bothered to do it any other way, but the characters here are a little smaller than both Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, and must be about the limit of what is practical to achieve using this method. By going down the originality route, as weird as it was, the creators of this game were a bit more free to mix it up and make something that was well tailored to the system, rather than desperately trying to hammer something in that won't quite fit, and well, it's better for it. It's probably not going to offer much to true fighting game aficionados, but it is a bit of a laugh to play and good for a casual blast. A worthy contender in the world of Master System games and a limit pusher? Well, yes, I think it is. Phew, well, that turned out to be more drawn out than I thought it would be, and there's still so much that I've left out. But it's time to call this journey over for now and, well, get out and stretch our legs a bit. What about the Game Gear? Wasn't that nearly the same as the Master System? Well, sort of, but it was a smidge more powerful in some ways and a smidge less in others, and it had a whole load of exclusives. So that one, I think, is for another video. I think some people may be surprised about the games that I've featured here. I mean, I'm sort of surprised about what I ended up putting in because, well, yeah, I've missed out Sonic, I've missed out those big licensed titles that may come to mind when you think about the Sega Master System. But in terms of purely what was the most impressive, well, this is what I've dug up. But if you disagree, if you can think of any games that you think are better, of course, please do leave it in the comments below. So let's wind this one down. I will say goodbye for now. Thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you've got this far into this video and you haven't. And I'll see you next time.